This is Book Splash for this week and as always, it's a good time for all lovers of books and writers to converge and savor the moments. I am Michael or Latumbos and I welcome you to another promising edition of Book Splash on Splash FM 105.5. Today, we have a novella that discusses the challenge of women in married relationships and the burden of stereotypes and profiling piled on the women folk by the society. The book is titled The Married Whisperer, written by Tess Ajibosin and published in 2020 by Daneli Herald Communications. The author, Tessie Ajibosin, is a marriage and relationship counselor, and The Married Whisperer is her first published work. In this work, we meet six middle-aged women who make their friendship a ready shield, falling on their collective strength to navigate the challenges of their marriages and relationships. These intrigues are built on the backdrop provided by the family of Chris, Camille is wife and counselor to her friends. In a review of the book, Chi Gioke Azua Wu Siefe writes, and I quote, Camille is a married counselor and brings her expertise to bear on her conversations with her friends. She holds everything in balance for her friends, but like them, she too is not without her own demons. Her closet, the reader finds out much later, brims with intriguing secrets. In this book, we meet Camille and her team of women placating Bisola, who is sobbing bitterly and bemoaning her heartbreak on account of her husband's affair with his secretary. Bisola laments that she does not deserve what she is getting from Emmanuel. She tells the consoling women that she is a submissive wife. She obeys her husband, who demands that she should not work so as to take care of the children. She says that she has done all the Bible asks of a married woman. This is supposed to be the wife's meeting group, a period of prayer for women happening once every month at Camille's place. But Bissola's travails have truncated the prayer meeting on this day. The wife's prayer meeting group had been started 10 years earlier when they rallied around Amaka to pull her out of her depression. Following the brutal murder of her colleague, the meeting quickly became a once-a-month 90-minute girl timeout meant to get them get away and recalibrate. Over the years, it has continued to provide the women the space and time to speak freely without judgment. The group is for the women to talk, vent and discuss family and marriage issues, including cheating husbands, lazy husbands, delinquent children, dwindling sex lives and occupational troubles. You are still listening to Book Splash on Splash FM 105.5 Ibadan. And the book on the table is The Marriage Whisperer, written by Tess Ajibosin. Back to Bisola, she wants her husband Emmanuel to hurt as he hurt her. She wants him impotent. After all, if he cannot perform his husbandly role at home, he should not be able to do it elsewhere. Much later in the book, we read that Bisola's husband is attacked by some boys who rip off his manhood. Could this be Bisola making through a threat? In this book, the author brings to the fore certain stereotypes that society has piled up against women and how bold, audacious and successful women are perceived as loose ones who must have slept their way to the top. In this book, the author tells us about the stigmatization that women face in society, even in their place of work. So, Amaka is stigmatized at the office for being divorced. Even the married women in her office look at Amaka like she's just waiting to snatch their husbands from them. Listen to this matter as Amaka narrates it to Camille. Last week, my boss asked that I take over Amanda's shift since, quote, I do not have a man I answer to and Amanda had to go home to cook for her husband. Can you imagine? The sad part, Amaka continued, is that I'm made to take on assignments nobody else wants, but the ones that will contribute to growing my career is denied me. Can you imagine telling me, sorry, this promotion may be too much for you. You know you can't handle pressure. You just divorced it. Jeez, who said that? I gasp in horror. Mrs. Obili, the MD. All married women look at me like I'm just waiting to snatch their husbands from them. End of quote. Another woman in Yobong seems to have a special problem. She's in deep trouble as she is involved in a secret affair with her brother-in-law. Well, the brother-in-law dies much later of heart attack, but the guilt will be with Yobong for some time. You're still listening to Book Splash on Splash FM and I'm discussing the book The Marriage Whisperer, written by Tessie Ajibosin. In a sudden twist in the plot, 
Chris, Camille's husband, hangs himself in his study. His suicide note shows that he has been the one behind the resolution of the problems of some of the ladies. He owns up to arranging the robbery of Bisola's husband, the poisoning of the cigarettes that killed the brother-in-law who had been having a secret affair with Inyobong. He indicates in the suicide note that he is aware that he is not the father of the children born by Camille, his wife. The secret of his medical condition has been hidden from him for quite long. The intriguing secrets that are the hallmark of Camille's life suddenly creep to the fore. Her children are a souvenir from her secret affair with Femi, as Chris's medical conditions show, and everything becomes clear to the reader. In the final analysis, this work is a beautiful fiction. In the final analysis, I agree with Chijoke in his conclusion on the book, The Marriage Whisperer, as he says of the book, I quote, the book will definitely appeal to a cross-section of readers interested in the day-to-day -day experiences and articulations of marriage and relationship challenges. In this nine-chapter, 60-plus page novella, Ajibos impacts enough punch that will require a lot more pages for its unpacking. This demonstrates that there is no such a thing as a perfect marriage. Every couple carry their own baggage, but how they go about the secret in their cupboard makes all the difference. This is still Book Splash on Splash FM, and it's time to meet my guest, the author of the book, The Marriage Whisperer. In this conversation, Tessie Ajibosin tells me why she wrote the book, her writing experience, and key messages in the book. I'm speaking with Tess Ajibosin. She's the author of the novella, The Marriage Whisperer. Welcome to Book Splash. Thank you so very much, Michael. All right. So let's talk about uh, the book first. Uh, basically, I have uh, three items, the book, the author, and the message. So let's focus on the book okay. first of all. Tell okay. me what occasion this book. Okay, I have uh, been a marriage counselor for quite a while and um, also been married for 18 years this year. Mm. So um, I have been getting a lot of people coming to me for advice and I have been putting together a book in and around marriage. Okay. But um, in my first book, I wanted it to be not so serious mm. in that I didn't want it to be an advice book. Uh, you do this or don't do that in marriage kind of book. Mm. I wanted it to be a fiction that would still drive on some message. Mm. So I decided to write a fiction, which was obviously inspired by um, marriage and people's um, circumstances in and around marriage in mm. Nigeria. Mm. A fiction about uh, you know challenges that people face in their marriages. Uh, yes. I, I, I like I like that as a background to you know writing a book. If you look okay. around you today, most of the things that you have represented in this book are found almost everywhere, almost every day. So there are yes. regular occurrences that we encounter uh, on a daily basis. So basically, that's why you wrote the book. Now, yes. let me just open the book up a little and ask okay. you. Uh, you said it's a fiction. Uh, yeah. You know, it's a very big question for me. We were told in yeah. class that, uh, you know, art is a slice of life. <laughs> and many people yeah. say that, you know, essentially books, creative works are, you know, partly or partially, you know, autobiographical. So let's yeah. start with that. Um, okay. How would you respond if the question was to be, did you experience or any of the things that you wrote in this book or did anybody directly related to you experience something related to what you have in the book? Okay, so not directly. Mm. Um, when it comes to um, art imitating life, mm. in this book, our, um, the mannerisms of the characters, of some of the characters, mm. are mirrored in either my mannerisms, mm -hmm. my husband's mannerisms, mm. or my children's mannerisms. Mm. So, obviously, these are the things that I am um, exposed to and um, um, like it's basically a part of my life. And those mannerisms, for instance, me drinking coffee when I know it's not good for me, mm. that's me. That's completely me. And that is also mirrored in the character there. Mm. Um, the children playing basketball, my kids will play basketball every minute and every hour of the day if you mm -hmm. let them. Mm -hmm. So those mannerisms are the things that mirror mm. uh, the real life characters. Outside of that, the story in itself, they're, they're not directly related to anybody that I know. Mm. Uh, directly. Yes. Uh. All right. So um, we have in your book, 
six women, including your narrator, oh, you have a first person perspective here. So we have Camille, Bisola, Inyobong, Gloria, Amaka, and Adi. All these women are in a mesh, more like a web. Um, they are caught in between gender stereotypes. Um, you know, they are caught in between the fact of uh, challenges of their marriages and relationships, even outside of marriages. Uh, yeah. Now, I like the way you weave these stories into one another. And I like okay. to uh, just ask you, sometimes society, uh, you know, creates a box for women and women willingly enter these boxes. <laughs> One of those things I draw out from the book is the claim or the narrative that successful women must naturally be housewives or people who are married and are subservient or obedient to their husbands. In your book, you have some women who are deciding to break the ice ceilings. That is a deliberate campaign in your book, right? Um, not necessarily, sir. It's a depiction of where we are as women in the society now. Mm. It's a depiction of the fact that um, most women are no longer okay with just being the mere housewife. Mm. Um, they want to have, they have dreams, they have passion, and they want to pursue those passions and want to be labeled as failures mm. and wanting to pursue those passions. So essentially, Essentially, uh, the book tells me that there's no perfect marriage or that there's no perfect life as you have yeah. in your book. But I have a question yeah. here. You know, many times when we say that um, women are also helping to shoot down their women folk, people yeah. say it is not true. But in the life of Amaka, as we have it in your book, even a female boss, you know, is stigmatizing her for being divorced. I recently read a book uh, where a woman is also stigmatized for being divorced in the church, that she cannot hold office in the church because she's not married or because she has left her husband and the rest of it. So tell me how you want society to respond to women's issues when women themselves are also in the middle of this, um, if you like, stigmatization. Okay, so the thing is, the, what women want is not to be treated differently. It's to be treated the same. A man who is outside of uh, a wedlock or who is married is not physically labelled and treated as uh, an atomai in the society mm. because of his marital situation. Mm. His expertise in whichever area he's supposed to be bringing to the table is what is determined. Mm. And that's all that most women are asking for. And that's what the book is seeking to, is seeking to point out. It's not a women against women campaign mm. because there are lots of women who support and bring up and uphold women. Mm. But the truth of the matter is that the seats at the table, at the managerial table, at the top table, mm. the seats for women are so few and far between mm. that in the end, it seems like the two or three women who have attained the, that seat will have to fight each other in order to get that seat, mm. rather than fight to get more seats at the table. And that is where we have that notion that women are always fighting women. Mm. It's just the fact that the seats at the table for women are limited. So in order for them to get that seat, they seem to be at each other's throat. Mm. Which, what we should be doing is looking to get more seats at the table so that more women can be on that table together. All right, it's still Book Splash on Splash FM 105.5. I am discussing the book, The Marriage Whisperer. I am speaking with the author, Tessie Ajibosin. Let's come to you for a moment. Tell me, how did you come upon writing, you know, as a mode of expression? Um, I think general belief is that most people who write are people who read a lot. Okay. And I, my mother had an MSc in library science from the University of Ibadan. Wow. And she made sure that in every house we lived in, there was always a room dedicated as a library. Mm. So we always had books. There were always lots and lots of books in the library. Um, the books that were earmarked for my age, and uh, when I was younger, I probably finished reading them all and read all my mother's books as well. Wow. I remember when I was done with work, my mother said, okay, now you can read my Women's Weekly novel. She was subscribed to Women's Weekly, which was 
a romance novel that um, was based in the UK at that time. And you can read them, I'm like, I finished reading all of them in just a week. Mm. And she just shook her head and like, <laughs> mm. <laughs> you know, mm. So I've always loved reading and out of that, um, it was an escape for me. Uh, my parents' marriage was not perfect and there was a lot of bickering, a lot of, and so an introvert, which I was, mm. the books were my, my getaway. Mm. So I would hide in the books and then I would create my own story. Yeah. I remember my literature teacher was telling me that after reading my essays, he came to me and did this actually happen? I'm like, mm. no, it's supposed to be an essay in class. Mm. Mm. And you know, so basically my expression was drawn from a lot of any blood and growing up, a lot of novels growing up. Mm. And, uh, and the fact that I like to observe rather than speak. Mm. Mm. So, and and then uh, you read a lot of books, even the ones beyond your age and the rest of it. Can you tell me now, who are your influences in the writing firmament? I mean, those whose uh, works have, you know, really helped your craft as a writer. I, I think what really pushed me into wanting to write, um, and publish actually, would be James Patterson. I got introduced to James Patterson series of books mm. um, by my sister-in-law who sent me like 12 books at once and I didn't stop reading until the 12 were done and every time I have an opportunity to buy another James Patterson book, I would buy one. Mm. So in the international scene, he was, he was, uh, he was really some, someone I looked up to reading any and every other book. Mm -hmm. I loved reading and ensuring her as well. And uh, Chimamanda Adichie, um, okay. yes, I also love reading. Mm. I guess that's much. I, I guess that's much. Uh, so it's because your book, uh, real, you know, it has a very strong, um, you know, backing of the feminist movement. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's why I left Shimamanda for last. I really fixed it because I know once I mention Shimamanda, I will be linked to the feminist movement. <laughs> mm. Mm. Well, I should just ask you. This is your first published work. Um, yes. Uh, yes. So, how long did it take you to put this book together? Um, three weeks. Three weeks. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Oh. <laughs> and it was published in one month, one month after I started writing the book. Mm, wow. Okay, I'll return to, uh, you know, some elements in the book. I find something okay. interesting. I, I think we should talk about it. In your book, your central character, you know, is a marriage counselor, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. And um, uh, you also have a gathering, you know, more like a, a women's or girls, um, you know, group. Uh, you yeah. know, basically started as a wives' prayer meeting group, right? Yeah, yeah. The sense I get from here is that um, women need to have gatherings like this to help them to ventilate, to help them to, you know, share their burdens and also help them to find solutions collectively to their problems. Is that a deliberate design in your work? Yes, it is. And um, for most uh, women who are speak to, I mean, I even uh, actually given that advice this morning. When someone called and said, I have just tired. And I'm like, okay, you have a Take the children, we take them to somebody's house. We don't have to travel to go on a holiday. Be alone and just take care of you. If you're unable to take care of you, you can't take care of anybody else. Mm. So basically, that's the advice I give to most. Most of the time, women are so overwhelmed because um, we are at the workplace trying to make a living. We are also at home trying to make sure the family is uh, well cared for. We are basically everywhere and stretched to the limit most of the time. Mm. So if we don't find time to recalibrate, to understand that, okay, I'm just, it's just tiredness. It's nothing else. It's not that I'm, it, it's not that I'm suffering from anything else. It's not that my marriage is doomed. It's not, it's not anything fatal. Mm. I just need to rest. I just need time to recalibrate. Mm. It's a huge way of getting back yourself to the right, to the right frame of mind mm. in order to carry out. Mm. So yes, I do advocate for women to take time off to just be, to just mm. be them and not to be mommy or wife. Okay, so the central character in your work, I'd like to focus on her family for a moment. Uh, you know, I'm talking about Camille now, the, you know, the narrator. Uh, I find it interesting that um, while she is, uh, you know, trying to, you know, provide succor for uh, the other women, she also has, you know, deep issues in her own family. Uh, in fact, deep secrets are very difficult to, you know, really comprehend in this work. Uh, so why did her own family 
turn out that way uh, for her husband to commit suicide, right? And then you find that she has probably, you know, something more scandalous than all the other women whom she's helping to get their lives back. Why did you decide to, you know, turn your character this way? As an author, many authors decide to kill their character. Some decide to, you know, make a demon out of their character and the rest of it. What's your own design? Okay, so, um, sometime while I was writing this book, I remembered a woman, a woman who was actually my sister a lot of advice um, in and around marriage. She was basically in control of some stuff. She was quite popular mm. and quite well regarded. And then she announced that she was leaving her marriage. Mm. And she was trolled and she was abused and wow. everybody saying, how can you who are giving everybody advice about marriage, you're now leaving your own marriage, that means you've got no idea. Mm. So basically out of that, I felt for her and then I wanted people to realize that when someone goes out of their way to assist you with situations, if they assist that they give to you what take it mm. and don't judge them their own situation. Because the fact that they're giving you this advice might actually be born out of experience that they themselves have gone through mm. and failed. Mm. They feel that it's but they don't want you to feel that it's so they're advising you based on that. Mm. But then for you to turn around and judge them for failing at it, which was what gave them the inspiration to be able to help you, I think that was wrong. That, that is wrong. And I felt I had to humanize her mm. to the point where we, whatever advice she was given, I mean, they are still valid advice, mm. but she still has a demon. All right. So she's not seen a superhuman. I mean, like you said, no marriage is perfect. Mm. Oh, so tell me now, what's your key message in this work for everybody? And by everybody, I mean society and uh, women folk, the women folk in our society of today. Okay, for everybody, I think when I sign my book now, when when anybody buys the book and I sign it, I always sign it to say happy mm. because that's the message. Because you don't. Um, stay in your situation and uh, judge your situation so harshly that you refuse to find happiness within your, your situation. Mm. So stay happy is my first message to everybody generally. Okay. Okay. Um, if you look at the back of my book, I basically wrote that I am intentionally happy. Yes. This means that you do not for anybody else to create your happiness. Mm. You have to find your happiness. You find your happy place within yourself and stay happy. That's my first message. My mm. second uh, message would be uh, like uh, the first, what you just pointed out in the beginning. No relationship is 100%. You have to work at it. Mm. So you stay within your relationship and work at it. And then the final message was um, the situation in which um, it's, clear, it's a medical condition mm. that a woman can actually have miscarriages mm -hmm. through no fault of ours, mm -hmm. but because a man is carrying a disease or a condition that it means that whatever child he deposits in her mm. does not come to full them. So understanding that in most in our community, even in this century, women are so blamed for childlessness and barrenness. Mm. So understanding that was a good, a good, uh, a good, really something I would have been before. Not that it's excusing the decision to, she took in order to address that, it's just given that information out there. Mm. Uh, you have a good book here, a very fascinating you know, story, you know, told very beautifully as well. Thank you very much. I've been speaking with the author of the book, The Marriage Whisperer, Tessie Ajibosi. Thank you very much for your time, please. Thank you so much, Michael. That was my conversation with Tessie Ajibosin, author of the book, The Marriage Whisperer. I hope you liked it. If you did, please join me same time next Saturday for another time on Book Splash on Splash FM 105.5 Ibado. I thank you for listening. In case you have a question or comment, please send me a message on 0805 699 8676 or email mollatumboso at splashfm1055.com. You can follow me on Twitter at Mike Tumboso. On behalf of my sound manager, Victor Daudu, I am Michael or Latumboso and I urge you to read the book today. <laughs>